Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here, and it's been a little while since we've done a live discussion here on the YouTube channel. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed all the interviews that we've had recently, including Eric Eager and Tej Seth with an analytics roundtable and Mike Renner as well. Uh, we just premiered that one on the channel. Really good conversation with a game of Am I Wrong? Uh, in that one. And Mike Renner finished with a prediction. If you were just watching that and you're jumping over here, his prediction is that the Minnesota Vikings will make a trade to the New England Patriots to get Drake May. That is his Vikings draft prediction. And just today, uh, in fact, it uh, came out after we were recording that. So I didn't ask him about it, but just today, the New England Patriots, their head man of their draft, Elliot Wolf. He's not their general manager. He's something else. Doesn't matter. He did a very long press conference with the Boston slash New England media. And within that press conference, he called them, quote, open for business. So here we are to talk about what that business might be. Answer your questions, have a conversation, get some of your takes and just I would love to know from everybody in the chat, a good place to begin would be, how are you guys feeling? We are one week away and I haven't really done a show talking about the magnitude of this thing. I hope that to do that next week with somebody, whoever I get on the show, uh, to really discuss truly the magnitude of what is about to happen on draft night for the Minnesota Vikings. But Give me a sense here. Give me your feeling. Describe it in three words. Where you're at with this. Are you quietly confident? Are you, I got a, a message from somebody earlier that they're having dreams about the draft every single day. That's how much they're thinking about it. Uh, I like this from Scotty. I'm tired, boss. <laughs> That's a good place to start. Give me your three words on how you're feeling one week out from the decision 2024 Minnesota Vikings quarterback. And uh, we can dive into your thoughts on the Patriots saying they're open for business. I also did look at uh, some other Patriots reporters and the full quotes from Elliot Wolf, who is the director of scouting is his uh, actual title. And he also said he was asked if the team would be comfortable drafting one of the top three or four quarterbacks with the number three overall, one of the top three, I guess, uh, says, I think we'd be comfortable with it. So there you go. Uh, he is saying we're open for business, but also saying, I think that we'd be comfortable with it. Um, so how to read into that exactly, I don't know. But the question for me comes down to how much are the Vikings willing to give up? And in what scenario would the Patriots actually say yes? So do we think that the Patriots are not as comfortable with those quarterbacks and would trade out uh, because they don't believe that Drake may or JJ McCarthy is worth that high of a pick. Are they in on JJ McCarthy and they think they could trade back with the Vikings then potentially trade back up or stay at 11 and get JJ McCarthy. I also have here on my phone, Arif Hassan's consensus draft board that he does every year that has some very interesting conclusions about the quarterbacks. So there's a bunch of different scenarios to go over here regarding the New England Patriots. One of them is just the simplest, most straightforward one is if Caleb Williams goes number one and Jaden Daniels goes number two and the Patriots are not ready to take a quarterback and they think, ah, we're in a place where a quarterback might really, really struggle here with this supporting cast, which is so bad. They don't have a good offensive line. They don't have good wide receivers. There's really nothing there to work with. It's not some amazing running game like it was in Tennessee with Derrick Henry. We need years of drafting and developing and signing players. So we're going to push that decision down the road because we don't want to be Carolina. I think what happened to Carolina last year would be a cautionary tale to the New England Patriots. Because Carolina was all in their owner saying we're drafting Bryce Young number one, no matter what. So then they trade up, they give away DJ Moore, a tremendous wide receiver. They give up what ended up being the number one overall pick this year. And then Bryce Young doesn't even look that great. 
if you are the Patriots, you might look at Bryce Young and go, well, why was Bryce Young so bad? I mean, number one, he might just be too small for this league. That is a possibility, but also look at what he was dealing with around him. Now look at what is on the Patriots. KJ Osborne, old friend, that's wide receiver one or two for the Patriots. Kendrick Bourne, wide receiver one or two. Did they have an okay running back? They don't have much as far as star talent on the offensive line. Do they have any argument for competing in the AFC East next year with Josh Allen, with the Dolphins that had a great season last year? And I don't buy into the New York Jets, but still the New York Jets have way more talent all over the field than the New England Patriots. I mean, if they put a rookie quarterback into that situation, you are talking what three wins, four wins. If the guy is not amazing right away. So that would have to be the case that the Patriots just view their situation as being so miserable and so bad roster wise that they are okay with trading back, or they have to think that they can either trade back up to get JJ McCarthy, or they could stay at number 11 and get the guy that they want because There is no guarantee whatsoever that the top four are actually the top four in the NFL or within the minds of these teams. I shouldn't even say the NFL because all 32 teams don't get to give their decision. Only a handful of teams that are making this decision, the Vikings, Washington, the Patriots, they're the only ones whose opinion matter here for these quarterbacks. So if the Patriots Say the Patriots, they they looked at all these guys. They looked at McCarthy. They looked at uh, Michael Penix. What if the Patriots say, you know, actually Michael Penix was the guy that we liked the most when we sat down with, he jived with us the most. We loved his arm. Robert Kraft came in the building and said, he reminds me of a Bledsoe. Pick him at 11. Well, then they could trade back and still take a quarterback and get the Vikings draft capital. In that case, if that was their opinion. So there's a few different routes that could lead to the Vikings trading with the uh, New England Patriots. You know, I, I, I think that there are several paths. It's not just only one scenario that leads to them with the Patriots. It's also if the Vikings like Drake May, the Patriots like J.J. McCarthy, the Patriots could also try to move back up. They could go back to 11, get some Viking draft capital, use less draft capital to move to five or four and still pick their guy and end up with a net positive. Because I do think that teams these days, and we see a lot of trades in the first round, are really thinking a lot about how to squeeze every last ounce of draft capital out of uh, what, what they have. And so maybe that is a strategy potentially for the New England Patriots. I don't think that Elliot Wolf of the Patriots saying that they're open for business guarantees that they're open for any business and any offer, which is the other part of this. So we've established that there are scenarios in which they could want to trade out if they like other quarterbacks that are later on most people's boards, or if they don't feel that this is the time to draft a quarterback and they think, well, we'd rather draft two offensive players at number 11, you probably got a wide receiver, a great offensive lineman, the way that it really, this draft plays out. If you're new England, if you trade back to 11 and 23, you could get one of the best, if not the best offensive tackle out there. That's a good place to start. And then in the back end, there's all these wide receivers that could potentially be first round talents. And I mean, that's a good start for new England in their, in my mind, complete rebuild. Then they win three games with Jacoby Brissett and whoever else. And they try to draft Shadur Sanders or whoever establishes themselves as the top draft pick. All of that works as a decent enough strategy for the Patriots. If they aren't truly, truly in love with a quarterback, or if the quarterback they're in love with is Drake may, and he's taken at number two, then would the Vikings trade up for Jaden Daniels? I don't know if, that's the guy that the Vikings would do it for. Um, But if you're the Patriots, you do have to wait. You have to wait and see who goes number two before you make this decision. I think 
because if Washington's not telling anyone, which they're not, then New England and the Vikings both have to wait till that number two pick is off the board. And I, I do think that we're going to spend the next week scrolling Twitter, turning on all the notifications and everything else, and probably not get this news about a trade until they're actually on the clock it, until new England is on the clock. And then we'll know, did they have a quarterback they wanted to take there all along? It, it, was it Drake may was it Jaden Daniels? That was our guy all along. The only guy for us and sorry, Vikings, we were just kidding that we were open for business. Or do you think that that was a way of signaling? Hey, somebody come beat this Vikings offer. I've, Got to think that the Vikings have already put an offer down to say, this is what we are willing to give you. Will you take it? And if you're the Patriots, you're probably thinking, well, we will take it if, if it's not our guy at number three, if it's Mayor Daniels is taken, whichever one they like more or less, then they'll take it. If it's not, then they'll trade it. Maybe that's the way that they're looking. Uh, but there are so many different avenues that could lead to the Patriots uh, decision here to trade with the Vikings that it remains a very plausible scenario. I don't want to call it likely because I still think when you get an opportunity at the top of the draft like this, there's not that many seasons that you expect to end up at the top with multiple quality quarterbacks because if their plan was to tank next year, well, remember when the Vikings tanked and they missed out on Andrew Luck and then they got a tackle who ended up being not all that good. So you don't want to be that team. You don't want to kick it down the road and say, all right, well, next year, that's when we'll really draft the quarterback. But what if they don't have the quarterback on the board next year, as opposed to this year where they have multiple very good quarterbacks that they could take at the top of the draft. So I would still lean toward the Patriots staying at number three and making their draft pick and the Vikings doing what we've kind of thought all along, which is maybe moving up to number four or number five or staying at number 11. But as far as the Vikings offer, so let's say that one of those situations happen. Let's just say that the Patriots love JJ McCarthy the most and they actually think that they could get him later, that they could get him at 11 if they stayed. And we'll talk about uh, the consensus board and what that suggests in uh, you know a little bit here. But let's just say, what do we think the Vikings would have to give up? What is too much? Where is the line? I was asking this to Tage Seth and Eric Eager the other day, and neither one of them really wanted to plant their flag on this is too much. So is it too much to go with 11-23 in next year's first if you're getting the number three overall pick? I do not think that that's too much. I think that that is a completely fine amount to send to the New England Patriots and that it's totally fair. You switch picks, they end up getting still 11 in the first round, 23 to help them fill out their roster, and then next year's first from the Vikings, which should be considered pretty darn valuable because as of this moment, the Vikings are probably a seven-win type of team, and if anything goes wrong, you could end up in a Carolina situation where you're giving up the, the top draft pick. So if you're New England, that is pretty darn favorable for you if you're getting those three picks. That is my line usually. Can you go farther than that? The four first round picks seems pretty wild to me. Two this year and then two the next two years. That feels like a bridge too far. It feels like you are reaching uh, a little bit here. And I think when uh, you're talking about maybe adding some additional third round capital down the road, then I'm a little more on board. I'm not too concerned about that. If you were talking about a third round pick to go on top of this, just to be able to sweeten the pot enough for them to finally say yes. Okay. Four first rounders is giving away your entire franchise for one player. And one thing that stuck out to me 
with Kwesi Adafo Mensah that he said the other day at his press conference was he was talking about what are the odds of actually getting that guy who is your legendary quarterback. So he said, any of us would sign up for four. He didn't say four picks, but I'm paraphrasing. Any of us would sign up for four picks if it resulted in Drake May being a superstar, right? We all agree with that because you've already got the left tackle. You've already got the wide receivers. You're, you've already got a lot in place, a lot of young defensive talent. So you're not a total trash roster that is not going to be able to succeed. So if you think that the guy is going to be great, I mean, the chiefs are the example, but the bills are kind of an example of this too, where the bills lost players over the last couple of years. They had players decline and yet they're within a field goal of potentially beating the Kansas city chiefs. I mean, they are on the doorstep of going to the super bowl and they did not have as good of a roster as they did, you know, a couple of years ago. And so we see that great quarterbacks can raise the level of any roster, get the most out of players and give you a chance to be able to succeed. But what Quasi said was, what are the odds of hitting on that type of quarterback? And the answer is they're not great. They're not impossible, but they're not great. It's not like there is a 50% chance that you find the next Josh Allen in Drake may it's more likely that he'd be a notch down and that he would be even in the best case scenario, a good quarterback. That's why I've made that ceiling comparison of Matthew Stafford or Eli Manning. And then you go, all right, well, maybe this helps us. Maybe this helps us decide. So what are the odds that the guys Mahomes? Yeah. 10% is, is in the chat. I think it's that or less, right? I mean, Mahomes or Allen, there's only three to five quarterbacks like that in the NFL at any given time throughout NFL history. It's not a very good chance. If even if we do by the math of say out of 32 teams, how many quarterbacks fall into that category? It's less than five. It's probably three, four. So 10% is about right. If are are you giving up four first round picks for a 10% chance at greatness? No, But what if it's very, very goodness? So now if we expand this out a little bit and we say, all right, well, Mahomes and Allen are number one and two, but what about some of these other guys that are really, really good? And we can go back a little bit in history, recent history, a Roethlisberger, who's not Brady or Manning, but really, really darn good. And then with a great franchise ends up winning Super Bowls, Phillip Rivers that had a great career in uh, San Diego slash Los Angeles for a little bit, Philip Rivers. Now, if you could get that or Eli Manning, would that be worth four first round picks? So this gives us an idea of how high the bar has to be because even with Eli Manning or Matthew Stafford or Philip Rivers, there might be a part of you that goes, I don't know if that's even quite worth it, which means... I mean, I think that those guys are because they are good enough to win the Super Bowl. As we've seen, Philip Rivers probably should have won one, didn't quite get there, but they're they're all chunked into that same next level down, fantastic quarterbacks, franchise tenure. And that's another part of this as well, because if you're talking about giving up all these draft picks, yes, it will hurt you. But if this quarterback can be a long-term, an Eli Manning of Philip Rivers, where you're talking about the whole, you know, year after year, this is your franchise quarterback. Then can you work around the fact that you gave up some first round picks? The Vikings failed on some first round picks and it hurt them throughout the years. And so maybe that's your evidence that like, Hey, I mean, if you're going to draft a Mike Hughes or something, uh, you know, that's going to hurt you. Well, you, now you don't even have that pick, but think about how much those picks not working out hurt the Vikings when they picked corners or even Garrett Bradbury is a good player, but not a transcendent great player, just kind of another guy at the position that hurts you. Right. And so the reason the Vikings weren't good enough with Kirk was somewhat because Kirk is limited, but somewhat because Kirk is expensive and also somewhat because they missed on so many draft picks. So imagine instead of missing on them, you just don't have them at all. That means there's a lot more pressure to be able to spend that cap space. And that is 
the one counter argument. If you're saying, look, if you give up all those draft picks, you're not going to have enough elite talent to be able to compete for a Super Bowl, especially with Chicago, with the Lions having a good team, with Green Bay on the rise. The one counter argument would be you are one of the most, if not the most favorable franchise for free agents to join. We've seen that back-to-back years from the NFL PA, and you're going to have many millions of dollars to spend in free agency or to acquire talent through trades, and you already have a good amount of young talent. When we look at the core of this team and who the players under the age of 25 are that will be here for the next five years, we've got some pretty good names on that list, and including even just solid players. If they re-sign Cam Bynum, Josh Metellus is going to be here for years. Ivan Pace is going to be here. Jonathan Grenard signed a four-year contract. He's going to be here. There's a lot to work with, but that f- other first-round pick, that's the one that's extremely, extremely hard to give up. And you know, the reason uh, some of you are asking about you know Washington, the reason I, I wouldn't talk about Washington is just I don't think they're giving up the pick for anything. Uh, they'll They'll just do it. I mean, they're in a position where Uh, They have changed ownerships. They've been a wreck for a really long time. They desperately need to trade to draft a quarterback there. They're not moving. They're just, they're going to pick their favorite guy. They had a speed dating thing. I don't know if you guys saw this, but they brought in a bunch of quarterbacks all at once. And I think took them to top golf. Top golf's really fun. I wish I was invited, but huh? That was kind of an, an odd move from them. I guess getting one last look at all of these guys before they solidify their boards my understanding is that in this few days before the draft, then it's all planned out. That's when they all, you know, decide. Um, but I, I mean, I don't think that Washington would say yes to anything. Washington wants to get excitement. They want to get people in the building. They want to get a new quarterback to go with their new head coach to build around. The Patriots are much more of a solidified franchise that's been really freaking bad the last couple of years and could stay down there for a while. Washington has more to give a a quarterback as well. Terry McLaurin's a great receiver. They've got a few other guys. It's not like that's as bad, uh, but you know, I I think that um, Washington is a position where you can't even talk yourself into how they would move out of the number two pick where the Patriots have mentioned numerous times. We are willing to do it. We are open for business. You know, we'll listen to that phone call and are they hinting at, yeah, we've got an idea that we might do this. Are they preparing their fan base for the potential that they might do this? I thought of that as well. When I saw Elliot Wolf's uh, comments there, are they kind of telling their fans a little bit, Hey guys, you know, we might not get that quarterback you love, but this is better long-term. So I still, if I were doing pie chart of what I think is going to happen, I would still guess that the Patriots do draft a quarterback, but in the potential pie chart options, I would also throw out there that JJ McCarthy might be that quarterback. And there could be a scenario where Drake may is at four. And then, you know, now you're talking about um, moving up to number four instead, giving up those three first. So I think where it does get tricky is if you're deciding how much else would you add other than the three first round picks onto the pot in order to make sure you get Drake may and going back to that odds discussion. So maybe it's 10% chance that you get true greatness. Number one, two, three quarterback in the league, but it's probably only 20% that you get really good, really, really good. 25%. What's more likely is that you get Jalen hurts. You get Tua. You get Justin Herbert, who I would qualify as being a good quarterback, but not a great quarterback yet. He has the potential to be, but if he was true greatness, then Brandon Staley would still have a job. He's just good. If the Vikings had Justin Herbert, though, where are they at this moment? You would feel amazing about that. That's probably closer to what? Maybe 40%. And then if you can add the fact that you have Justin Jefferson, add the fact that you have Kevin O'Connell, all these percentages get pushed up a little bit. So maybe it's 50%. Would you trade everything for a 50% chance that the guy could be Justin Herbert? Now that's a hard one because I'm not really sure of that answer 
since Justin Herbert is not able to take his team over the top when they haven't had enough talent, he's just been good. He's put up good numbers, but hasn't been truly great. At the same time, they didn't have Justin Jefferson. Uh, they had Keenan Allen's good player, but they didn't have the complete offense. They didn't have the left tackle. Well, they did have the left tackle. They didn't have any defense. How about that? They didn't have a running game. The Vikings can use that, but they really didn't have a defense. And going forward, I do believe the Vikings with Brian Flores have uh, raised up their floor just by having Brian Flores. And you probably, some of you saw the discussion that we media had with Brian Flores the other day about his head coaching situation. It's not going to happen. I don't think that Brian Flores is getting back in the head coaching ranks just because of the way that things played out in Miami. And when you're suing the league, you're probably not getting that opportunity. That means Brian Flores could be here for a long time and build this defense from his vision. That's really what wrecked the chargers, right? What wrecked the chargers was the fact that they just had a terrible defense and Brandon Staley was not actually good at calling a defense or building a defense through the draft. But if the Vikings took Justin Herbert and plopped them down here for the next three, five years, you have a chance to win a Super Bowl every year, right? Uh, that's how I would look at it. So if it's a 50, 50 shot, this is where the mind experiment gets real interesting to me with the Patriots. If it is a 50, 50 shot that your guy becomes Justin Herbert or better, is that worth trading four first round picks for? Because the other percentages are not, you be, you, he's just a bust. He's Johnny Manziel. The other, the other 50% is not that the other 50% is just different shades of not good enough. It's Baker Mayfield or it's, you know, I don't know. There's been a number of quarterbacks, you know, Carson Wentz who gave them one chance at it and was pretty good, but is not great. Right. Uh, and not a true franchise long-term quarterback. So there's the other side of the 50% that maybe you could have one shot at winning with, but it's unlikely you're going to get that shot. If you give up all your draft capital, unless you have some other plan uh, to acquire really great players, which they may. So that that's where it gets really difficult is I think that we all know there's a baseline for this, which is you could be, you know, in for those three first picks and not feel like it's going to crush you. I would not feel that way because really you're swapping your first one. So that, you know, okay, that's fine. The second one you acquired just by moving up. It's really kind of like a second round pick. And then for next year, that's the one you're not super happy about, but you can manage by using your cap space. When you start adding more onto it, okay, all right, now you're getting to the point where it will hurt you long-term that not only do you not have those players, but you also don't have the cap advantages that go along with those players. So whew, trying to work my way through this <laughs> as uh, the Patriots were in the news today talking with their media. And there's just a, a lot of different ways that this could play out with new England and with the top of the draft and a, and a lot of difficult decisions for the Vikings, because if it was just a, which quarterback do they like, then it would be, all right, well, we'll just see who they pick, but it's not only what quarterback do you like? It's what quarterback do you like at what price? So how much better is Drake may than JJ McCarthy. How much better is JJ McCarthy than Bo Nix? or Michael Penix. Uh, do we think they're all going to be there? And Elliot uh, Wolf did drop something. Let me make sure I got the quote correct. Uh, it, he dropped something about six quarterbacks in this draft. And so I think clearly the NFL is thinking, at least we know this about the same quarterbacks we're thinking about <laughs> as being the six. He referred to a top six quarterbacks, called it a unique year at the position. I totally agree. And that's why, by the way, that's why him calling it a unique year. I have suggested on the show that if you end up with Michael Penix or Bo Nix, it's not a tragic outcome and you shouldn't call it Christian Ponder and freak out and everything. Sorry, I wasn't supposed to say his name on the show, but it's just a different year. 
This doesn't happen very often. It's probably happened a couple of times ever in history where you have prospects of this caliber that are available in the draft. So the fact that he called it a unique year and referred to six quarterbacks and the fact also that all these teams have been visiting with these six quarterbacks suggests that they're looking at all of them as potential top draft picks. And if the Vikings end up sticking at 11 because they don't want to give up all those first round picks, then you have an opportunity to you know, build around that player with extra first round draft picks and have the potential to be great that way. I tend to lean toward, I tend to lean toward it's a good idea to trade up to number three with the Patriots if they're willing to do it under whatever circumstance it, it comes about. If you're not giving up more than those three first round draft picks, if you're doing more than that, then I wouldn't say it's a terrible thing. I would just say it's really risky and it's going to feel like the mountain got steeper and the bar was raised higher for this quarterback. If you trade more than three firsts, then Drake may can't be just good. He can't be Carson Wentz and give you a chance. He's going to have to be better than that. He's going to have to be in that range of someone like Philip rivers or above that. He's probably going to have to be better than Justin Herbert, who he gets compared to. And then that just sort of shows you the formula. It's got to be this high in order for, uh, you know, to make it work. I mean, that, that's, that's a little daunting, right? Versus the bar is lower for Bo Nix to succeed at 11 or Michael Penix or JJ McCarthy at number 11. Then the bar is just lower. Uh, you don't have to, he doesn't have to be as good for the team to be great. If you end up picking him at 11 and pick somebody else at 23 and win five or six games with Sam Darnold and pick somebody else next year in the top 15. And this is the formula that has made this draft so interesting. It's not just, Hey guys, do you like this quarterback? I kind of like that quarterback. It's how much would you pay? for this quarterback. It's like a deal or no deal kind of game, except for uh, with quarterbacks. Something else I want to bring up regarding quarterbacks. I'm sure you're shocked that I'll continue to talk about them uh, is the Arif Hassan consensus draft board. If any of you listened to my discussion with Arif from maybe a week ago, very good one, really fun. Go back and check that out. Arif and I talked about what you can kind of use at your disposal and to some extent, the consensus draft board to understand what's going to happen or did your team reach or what is the, the wisdom of the crowd suggest about your quarterback? So what he does is he takes 75 different draft analysts, a lot of draft analysts out there, takes 75 different draft analysts and creates a consensus big board based on the average rankings of all these players. Okay. So here is what it says about the quarterbacks and where they all rank by Arif Hassan's consensus board. Hopefully you were following that bunch of draft boards all jammed together. What does the wisdom of the crowd say where they belong on a big board? So it's not a mock draft. This is how silly this is. Uh, it's not a mock draft. It's a big board, which means just if you're ranking all the players where you believe they should be as a prospect. That makes it hard to do for uh, quarterbacks, I understand, but here's what it says. It has Marvin Harrison Jr. as the top player in the entire draft with Caleb Williams right there and then Malik Neighbors and Drake May. So the only quarterbacks that are consensus draft board top five are Caleb Williams and Drake May. That makes sense to me because of the way that the whole draft season played out and the whole college season played out that Drake may was always there as number two until Jaden Daniels won the Heisman and had a crazy year and, you know, sort of rose his stock all the way up. Right. And uh, so you could see why still the big boards would favor Drake may over Jaden Daniels because Jaden Daniels had more of a late rise and there are some folks who just don't love Jaden Daniels as a top prospect that have him much lower on their board. I think somebody that dynamic and explosive belongs at the top. I don't make a big board because I'm not a draft analyst. I'm a Vikings reporter, but 
If I did, I would put Jane Daniels pretty high, but the overall consensus, what this tells us is from all the people who cover the draft, we've talked about how, Hey, Chris Sims doesn't love Drake may, or I forget who else, whatever other draft analyst doesn't like him. What this tells you is that the draft analysis world as a whole believes that Drake may belongs as the number two overall pick. So that's what, that's what the wisdom of the crowd thinks. So I go down the draft board and I'm scrolling, looking for, I'm seeing a lot of defensive players that you'd love to have the Vikings get. You're seeing your, uh, your Dallas Turner, your Quinion Mitchell, Terry and Arnold, Jared verse, uh, Liatu Latu. All right. Okay. Why am I still scrolling? Here's Byron Murphy. I'm still scrolling until number 22, which is where JJ McCarthy comes in and keep in mind again, it's not a mock draft. It's a big board. So you're just ranking them as prospects, but the crowd in this case is much different in terms of the gap between Drake may and JJ McCarthy. And I was listening to Dane Brugler talk earlier today about how early on in last year, he was talking about maybe the potential of JJ McCarthy as a first round pick. And he felt like he was the outlier because there weren't a lot of draft analysts talking about McCarthy. And then it's gotten to this point after they win the national championship, the combine where he thinks that McCarthy belongs as a mid to late round first round pick, but he's probably going to go in the top six. So, <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny how the, the draft works, right? But what the consensus board captures, I think, is my concern about giving up too much for J.J. McCarthy. As always, I'm going to adhere to what Kevin O'Connell thinks more than what I think or a consensus board thinks. But it does suggest that if you're watching J.J. McCarthy and you're not thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, this is the next great quarterback, you're not alone. That, that There are a lot of draft analysts who are looking at McCarthy and saying he's not a top five in the draft type of prospect, even if he's going to go in the top five. And this has to be, I don't know if the Vikings consider a consensus board or not. My guess is probably not. But if they have a similar feeling that J.J. McCarthy is more of a top 25 prospect, which is still very good and you can win with, then they would not say, though, yes, this is a guy we want to trade three firsts for. Maybe it's a guy you trade two firsts for. Maybe it's a guy you trade no firsts for. So it is, uh, uh, I agree with uh, Ben that says Arif's consensus board and Brugler's beast are a great pair. That is for sure. I mean, if you're, uh, looking through, trying to find all your draft information. Uh, that's uh, two very good resources. We have a lot of creative people in the world that um, find ways to help us out to understand what's going on in the draft. Because uh, if I had to watch all these players myself, I would be very confused. I've watched all the quarterbacks and I'm still confused <laughs> based on what everybody says about them. Now, you're probably wondering then how far ahead in the consensus big board is J.J. McCarthy from the other two quarterbacks. Got to do some more scrolling. Got to do some more scrolling. And now we've reached number 35, which is Michael Penix, and number 38, which is Bo Nix. So then you start to ask yourself this question. If you drafted Bo Nix at number 11, when the consensus board said 38, are you okay with that? I am mostly okay with that. I would say completely okay with that because that means that Kevin O'Connell spent time with him. He worked him out. He coached him up and he decided, no, no, the outside world doesn't know what they're talking about. I know what I'm talking about. We're picking him at 11. I am good with that. Even if it's at 11, would you prefer that it's 23? Oh yes. Would you prefer that it's you, you could get Byron Murphy or, you know, Terry and Arnold at 11. Oh, of course, of course, you'd rather pair your quarterback with some amazing defensive prospect, but you got to make sure you get one of them. So if it ends up being Penix or Knicks versus the consensus board, that would suggest that the Vikings reached. 
But here's the problem with using the consensus board for quarterbacks. It's not good at quarterbacks. It's good at a lot of things. I think it's borderline great at most other things. I don't think that the draft analysis world is good at all at evaluating which quarterbacks belong where. And a major part of that is that every team is looking for different and very specific things. So if you're ranking just on raw skills, what you think the guy can be, I mean, if you're doing an evaluation of a quarterback as a draft analyst, you're only looking at them saying, all right, what's my big picture thing here? If you dropped him into a neutral team, how would he do? But you're not dropping him into a neutral team. The Minnesota Vikings are dropping him into their team. So if they end up with Knicks or Penix, the consensus board will suggest that they reached and I will not care. And a lot of you, what will happen on draft night is you'll say, this guy's going to be a bust and I will also not care. You're already in the comments saying, if they get Bo Nix, he'll be a bust. I don't care if that's your opinion. I care about the opinion of the person who's making the call, which is going to be Kevin O'Connell. And if it, if it works for him, then I think it has every bit the chance to succeed as anything else. And we are talking about quarterbacks. And this is why I go back to that Elliot Wolf comment where he said it's unique. It's a unique year. It's different. It's not just, hey, there's two quarterbacks who are good. Everybody else has almost no chance. This is a year where the worst guy you think, you think, draft analysts think, who are wrong all the time, they think the worst guy threw 45 touchdowns and three picks and got sacked three times and is in the Heisman race and was a five-star player coming out and runs a four five. Like that's the worst guy, according to all of you. So I think that the draft analysis world has identified players in the past as first round picks who have been not anywhere close to that. And they've also underrated significantly players like Patrick Mahomes, for example, who was not high on consensus boards and ends up becoming the best quarterback. Josh Allen was not that high on consensus boards either. He wasn't the number one pick. He certainly would be if you redrafted him. So I don't have much trust in the outside world's ability to evaluate quarterbacks. And look, are the Vikings going to be perfect? Is Kevin O'Connell flawless and can never get fooled? No, but on draft night, when they make that pick, then he has a whatever equal chance of anybody else that's picked at that spot. So if they pick at 11, that means they think he was worth 11, which means he's got whatever other chance anybody else that's taken in the top 12 picks at quarterback has ever had. That's how I would look at it. And I would also focus on how does this guy fit? Because Kevin O'Connell talked about um, how, fit is going to be by far the most important thing. Uh, and, um, not a twerk asks, uh, where was Mahomes on his big board? I don't know that Arif was doing the consensus big board yet. When Mahomes came out, uh, there is another website called mock draft database where you can go back and find that. And I think he was, I think he was 20th on the, uh, mock draft database, big board. Uh, that's a very similar concept. It's a consensus. So I just, I mean, there's been so many examples of the quarterbacks being way different and some have worked and some haven't for whatever other different reasons. Uh, but when it comes to these quarterbacks, I just think that if they do the the right thing by the economics of the decision and they get the right fit guy, then you're going to have a great chance for it to succeed. So if you have Bo Nix at number 11 and you still get to draft number 23, which is going to be a top 10 defensive player in the entire draft. Now I'm I'm saying, I know Mahomes was taken at 10. The big board, the consensus big board had him farther back, right? Or or are you saying that Arif's big board had had him at 10? Um, Because I recall a lot of draft analysts not being high at all on Patrick Mahomes. And so there has been quarterbacks that have been taken higher that have succeeded. There's been, um, you know, Oh, uh, mock draft database. He was 10th on mock draft database. Is that right? Um, I thought I looked this up not too long ago, but either way, the point just being uh, that there's been examples either way. I looked through this for an article that I did not too long ago, where I took the consensus board versus where the guys were picked 
Some years they were right on. Some years they were way off. It was hard to figure which was which. 2020 is a good example of a draft where the consensus boards were right on for where the guys were picked, but then all of them turned out to be really great quarterbacks. And then 2021, a lot of people thought that Mac Jones was the top draft pick and they took Trey Lance and all those guys were no good. So it's, it's impossible to figure out. We can use all these tools. We could try to, you know, finagle, well, this will kind of work with my narrative or whatever I believe. Uh, I don't like Knicks because whatever draft analyst I like doesn't like him. Well, how can any of us really know? What we know is that whichever guy they take is going to have a great resume. There's not any one of these quarterbacks that are in the first round that has a bad resume, that has a Mitch Trubisky great example or Daniel Jones where you go, I mean, I don't know where, where's, where's the numbers or where's the, you know, where's the skill that says this guy's supposed to be way, you know, better than everybody else, right? Those were confusing. Nobody that they draft in this, in this draft is going to be confusing. It's really only about how much they're going to give up to get him. If they give up three firsts for McCarthy, I wouldn't call it confusing. I'd call it a little scary, call it a little scary to give up that much for a quarterback whose biggest talking point is, well, it's about what he's going to be, not what we saw him actually be. And that, 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 that sounds like a little bit on the, on the scary side, right? As opposed to, Hey, I can point to Bo Nix and show you, this is where he was great across the board. And it's really amazing the, how some of the draft analysts through the years have just seen these things, you know, differently. So it's, it's a fascinating conundrum that the Vikings have here. I would love to know how high of a price they think it's worth to go up and get Drake may versus JJ McCarthy. If they actually like one of the other quarterbacks better. I mean, gosh, it is uh, we're in such an interesting place uh, right now with the Minnesota Vikings. And I think that what Elliot Wolf did was he just poured a little bit of gasoline on this discussion that was like, all right, I mean, uh, you know, here, here we go. Like we're open for business. So feel free to give us a call. So, you know, I guess, I guess we're going to start to find out over the next week. We are not that far away, but, uh, you guys have been lighting up the comments. So, uh, give me, shoot me some questions, shoot me some thoughts here, uh, that we could talk about for a little bit because I was, I was, I was re-energized in the trade up discussion by Elliot Wolf. So thank you, New England Patriots media for, uh, firing that up today. Uh, let's see. Sue says, uh, Vikings are too scared to trade the farm to move up and get their guy. Then they should reconsider tanking. Uh, it's very clear that they do not consider tanking because they didn't tank to get top quarterbacks over the last two years. So they were never going to do that. I don't think scared is the right way to phrase it because as Quasi Dafalmenta said, you have to have a walkaway price for everything. I think that's true, right? No matter how much you want a car, if you go to the lot and they tell you, sorry, this car is $75,000. All right, I wanted that car, but I don't want it at $75,000, no matter what it's going to do for me. And the, the, I, if I probably lose the metaphor somewhere along trying to use a car example because the quarterback is so important, but at some point, uh, how about this? I can afford the $75,000 car, but I can't afford the insurance on it. So if I pay that, then I won't be able to get the insurance. I, I won't be able to put gasoline in it. That's kind of how it would be for trading four first round draft picks for Drake may. I, I can afford to give you these draft picks because I have them and it's going to be great because you, you're going to come in and be the shiny thing but can I give you what you need to succeed? And the answer is maybe yes, but it's a lot less toward yes. If you're giving up more draft capital, that's, they have to do that. It's not scared. It's just, that's the way life has to work uh, in the NFL when you're making these moves. Uh, Thuong, I think is your name. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, let's see for pick 11 and 23. If not only they just stay put, New England uh, probably picks uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. with no partner to trade with, then Arizona neighbors 
we could trade with Atlanta or Chicago. Well, not Chicago. Chicago's not giving you your quarterback, but I get what you're saying. Uh, you know, I've actually kind of thought about this. Now, I still think if New England stays, they're going to pick a quarterback. But there's also this J.J. McCarthy universe where you trade to seven instead if the New York Giants do not want him. If the Giants decide that they're taking Brock Bowers, then you jump up to number seven potentially if New England stays and then Arizona doesn't trade out and takes Marvin Harrison, the Chargers stay and take Joe Alt. Then you get to six and you go, all right, Giants, what are you doing? And they walk up and they go, the New York Giants have selected. And we're like, is it going to be McCarthy? Who's it going to be? And then they go, Brock Bowers. Oh, okay. Now you trade up to seven. Now you don't have to give up the farm and you've got yourself a pretty interesting scenario. Or you could just say, you know what? We're going to dare somebody else to give up their farm for McCarthy. But if he's really your guy, uh, then you want to go do that. Uh, Aaron says, uh, none of these guys are a sure thing. No risk it, no biscuit. I agree. I agree. My understanding is just my feeling about Quasi Adafo Mensa is that I don't think that Quasi Adafo Mensa came here to try to keep the plane in the air. I don't think that he, whatever metaphor you want to use to keep the car on the road, to hit the ball in the fairway. I think that he came here to try to go for it and win a Super Bowl. So if that's his mentality, then he might throw another log on the fire uh, or another whatever chip to the table. I don't know. I'm screwing up metaphors left and right, but you get what I'm saying. He might say, all right, all in kind of thing um, because you're, this is your shot. And that's kind of where I, I started talking about the magnitude of it. And I haven't really, because I've been so focused on the players, the reports, the draft guide that I'm working on purpleinsider.com is going to come out Monday. So I have just been horse blinders with the players and getting every draft analyst on and just being like, what do you think football, which quarterback? But as we get closer, I'm starting to feel it, right? The magnitude of this decision, this is one where your franchise has reached a fork in the road and there really are three ways <laughs> you can go straight on this and end up with just a guy, but the fork in the road is usually when you land at this spot, you are going to hit on this quarterback and make the right decision. And you're going to be in the mix to compete for a super bowl for real, not this bogus 8.5 win Vegas over under. Maybe if everything goes right and we make every final field goal and we get every last win or whatever, not that but legitimate Super Bowl contention. That's if you hit big. If you hit good, you can still have a year or two years where you could bring it all together and spend all your money and go all in and have an actual shot, especially in the NFC where, you know, if Caleb Williams hits and Jordan Love continues to be good, it won't be easy, but it's not Mahomes over there. So you still have a shot. There's sort of the other direction. And then there's the direction that none of you want to talk about because it's too scary which is the direction where it goes wrong. And then what happens? And then who's not having their job anymore? Or does Sam Darnold somehow become a good quarterback here? And Kevin O'Connell keeps his job. Do they find Brock Purdy in the seventh? Like then it becomes a really wild scenario, but this is a decision that is going to send this franchise in a new direction that none of us know where it's going. And that has been so fascinating to talk about but is also, you know, for a lot of you, I, I asked you for your couple of words to describe it. And most of them were either let's freaking go, or I'm really scared. Those were basically the two ways that you guys described your feelings. And for me, I just think it's, it's just really intense. And if you're Quasi Adafo Mensa and you're looking at this going, I have to toss in one more third, let's go for it. Because I don't want to regret it. That's probably the biggest thing that's important for them is you don't want to go back years from now and say, you know what? We had this offer on the table. We didn't do it. Why didn't we do it? Why didn't we make that one more trade up? Dave says, I, I love Nick's not as much as may, but don't trust McCarthy to get on the field. Yeah. I mean, I think that McCarthy does a lot of things well that could make him he feels like a guy that's a high floor, so to speak, sort of a, I mean, in the worst case scenario, is he a 
Colt McCoy or something like where he can get on the field and maybe win some games for you, but he's not going to be uh, different. There are a lot of people that love uh, Bo Nix and, you know, Mike Renner was one of them. He and I were just talking about that on that other video. If you want to go back and watch it after we're done here. Uh, but he was talking about really liking a uh, Bo Nix. And even if the consensus uh, is not in his corner, there are a lot of analysts who look at him as someone who could be very good as a fit for the Vikings. So I, I just, the economics of this are important. They're a major part of it until we start talking the way I just was about the magnitude. And then you go, you know what? I don't know if I care. <laughs> and then you go back to the history and you go, Oh wait, sometimes the fifth quarterback taken is the one that actually works out. Uh, let's see. Abre uh, says uh, open for business means may is going to Washington. Now that is possible. That is very, very possible. What is today's rumor of the day? I, I mean, is that Elliot Wolf? Is that what we're talking about here? I don't know. Was there another rumor that you saw that you want to throw out there for rumor of the day? Sometimes rumor of the day can be hard to figure out because it might be a fake account that's starting a fake rumor because somebody is a sociopath. So um, not always ex exactly uh, locked in with those rumors of the day. Uh, yeah, I get this email constantly, Miles, percentage chance that we swip swap picks with the Falcons. And I just don't know how to answer this question because when things are very, very unlikely, somebody sent me a message today and said, you know, are they going to trade Justin Jefferson? And it's like, no, I mean, I, I don't know. If, if I tell you that it's possible that the NFL comes in at the very last moment on the day before the draft and swings a sledgehammer on the Falcons and says, you're swapping first round picks. I would be shocked. I would be what, how are they, are they seriously doing this on the day before the draft or whatever? Now we're four or five days before the draft. Are they, what, what, is, what is happening here? I guess tomorrow is Friday, uh, you know, news dump day, but come on, that can't be serious, right? Is it possible? I guess, but I really don't think that what Kirk Cousins did or talked about is anywhere near egregious enough for the NFL to just come in on the last day before the draft and say, you know what? You're picking eight and you're picking 11. Whoop. Because the value of eight versus 11 is enormous. I mean, that would be a really, really harsh penalty for Kirk Cousins. What did he admit to? talking to some assistant coaches or something. I mean, was that really it? I, I just, to me, this feels like we have this stretch of boredom a little bit or a lack of big news stories between free agency comes to an end, slows down, NFL draft starts. There's a couple weeks in there where we don't have a whole lot. So some people needed the clicks and the discussion and started talking about this. But what's more realistic as far as this tampering thing goes is 2025 fourth and a fifth swap, not number 11 and number eight. Again, is it possible? I always have to say that everything is possible because this is the NFL and these are the Minnesota Vikings and the things I've seen since I've been here, I mean, have been pretty improbable, I would say. So that's how I'd put it. Percentage chance that they swap picks this year with number eight and 11 is very low, very, very low. I, I just, that's something I haven't really wanted to talk about because I just don't buy that it's going to happen. Scott says uh, NFL draft for quarterbacks, kind of like real estate location, location, location for landing spots. Really excited to see how this class develops. I agree. I agree. And that's why, you know, Daniel Jeremiah was talking about that on his conference call. Just the agents want their guy to land with the Vikings. Who wouldn't? Uh, Jacob says, what player would you add to the two first? So that's a good question. Jordan Addison, Lewis C. Okay. Uh, obviously Lewis scene would not get, um, <laughs> would not get any, uh, value back, but Jordan Addison is a bit of a stretch for me because this is another guy who is going to be very important to this succeeding and number two wide receivers are hard to find. This, I mean, you could say, well, look, you've already got your elite guy, Jefferson, just go find another one. They had to spend a first round pick to get it. They thought it was so valuable and so difficult to find last year that they spent a first round draft pick to get Jordan Addison. I would not want to give away Jordan Addison 
along with two first round draft picks to get up to number three, because I need that player to help my quarterback succeed. Maybe long-term that's foolish because, you know, you can find other wide receivers and you've already got your mega star. It's just, that is a lot. That's like giving a whole nother first round pick and then some that's worth more than a first round pick because the only reason first rounders aren't even worth more is because of the uncertainty of what you're going to do with it. But now you get certainty that the guy is a really good player. I'm going to say I would not do that. Uh, not Kevin O'Connell. Appreciate you changing your name. Says, uh, how bad does the Vikings pick have to be to not work on the rookie contract? Can you give a, 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 a let's see, competitive um, or a comparable level of competency? Yeah, that's a tongue twister there, not Kevin O'Connell. Yeah, um, that's why I bring up Carson Wentz from time to time because I look at that Carson Wentz 2017 season as here's what we know about Carson Wentz. He was about a 500 quarterback when he wasn't playing with great stuff. And that one year when he was playing with great stuff, he was not the guy who got them to the Super Bowl, but he put them in position to get to the Super Bowl was I think 11 and three, maybe or 12 and two, whatever it was as a starter before he ends up getting hurt. And he's got them looking like the best team in the NFL by far at, when he's the quarterback and competing for an MVP. What we really know about Carson Wentz was that he was just okay. And, you know, in the long term, he's made to look much worse than he actually was for some of those other years where he was going nine and seven, where he was just okay. Even the year with the Colts, he was just okay. He wasn't terrible. Uh, he was. Well, he was up and down, but that's what an average quarterback is going to be. That is the baseline level and Baker Mayfield as well, because they were a drive away that if you draft that guy and he's not that great, but is a 500 quarterback in like an equal or neutral situation, then I think with the Vikings, there would be a chance where he would have at least one year where he could give you a legit shot at winning or going to the Super Bowl in the same way that you know, Brock Purdy, uh, Jimmy Garoppolo is another one that you could say is baseline of competency. Jimmy Garoppolo with the 49ers was a great fit. He was a really good quarterback, but I think we all know that he was not a great quarterback, won a ton of games. Alex Smith would qualify for this, didn't reach a Super Bowl, but somebody who was very, very good, not totally great, and still won a ton of games and put them in great positions uh, overall, I mean, what was, I mean, Alex Smith's career record is something crazy because he was good. He was talented and then played for really good teams. That's kind of what you're looking for. And then hoping at some point that's the worst you want is that you're hoping at some point you have that one year where it comes together. But I would say that's a, a successful draft pick. If you have at least that one shot, uh, digits, hang on. I, I'm going to, I'm going to open this. I haven't opened this in an hour, so I need a, need a little drink here. So you can just you can just all think about what Digits is asking here. Digits is asking, do you think the Vikings fan base can handle sitting a quarterback for one full year? So answer that to yourselves while I open this. All right. Everybody thought about it? I'm refreshed. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Is it a full year or are we talking about maybe 10 weeks, 12 weeks of Sam Darnold? I think so. People would get itchy for sure. If Sam Darnold was out there struggling to get the ball to Justin Jefferson. Yeah, it wouldn't last the whole season if it was a struggle. Now, if Sam Darnold was doing okay, if the Vikings were, let's just say five and four after nine weeks, six and five after 11 weeks, seven and five, eight and seven, if they're win one, lose one most of the way, then yeah, you can deal with that. And after a bad loss, you would definitely hear people saying, well, it's time to bring him off the bench. Here we go. If it was going very badly, if they were two and five, then we all probably agree. Yeah, it's just time. And one thing we know from Kevin O'Connell is he can want that quarterback to sit 
He's going to play that guy if he gets frustrated because we saw this from Jaron Hall last year. Jaron Hall was not in a position to play in the NFL, but Nick Mullins threw all those picks and he was like, nope, I'm out. Uh, bring me Jaron Hall. Give me somebody else, anybody else. And uh, that worked out very poorly, actually, for Jaron Hall and everyone involved. So I don't think that uh, Kevin O'Connell has the patience to go a whole year if Sam Darnold is struggling, but Sam Darnold as a Carolina Panther, and think of what an atrocity that was. He went eight and nine. If he goes eight and nine for the Vikings, can you tolerate that for a season? You'd be in the hunt and you would for sure after bad losses think, is it time? And we'll talk about it. We'll debate it, I'm sure. But you're not sitting there saying, oh my gosh, I just can't watch this football anymore. So I think the answer is it's very dependent. That, that's what I would say. It's very dependent. Drummer Dave, good to see you, buddy. Knicks or Penix, stay put or bust. Okay, so does that mean that you uh, you want to stay at 11? I think that's fair. I, I mean, I really do. This is, what's, um, this is what's tricky about this draft class is that everybody who makes their case to me that isn't, I know this guy's going to be a bust. So any other argument. I can usually get behind. I, I, I honestly can't. I, I honestly can usually get behind anything else except for, I know this guy's going to be a bust. Well, okay. Nobody knows who's going to be a bust. So I, I can't get behind that. But if you tell me, if you make your case to me and you say, look, I am not convinced that the odds of JJ McCarthy at four are any different than the odds of Bo Nix at 11 for success. You think, well, history is kind of on your side there. So there is that. And if you said, look, Nix is a better fit than McCarthy because he gets the ball out. He's more polished. He's more refined. You don't have to sit him a year. You can bring him in. You can start playing him right away. Get him into the offense. He he's, he's already worked his mechanics out over the years. That's why he took that big step. KOC's all in. I'm like, okay, all right. Well, that makes sense to me. You'd prefer not to give all that up. So, you know, that's where when you say, all right, stay at 11 and take your favorite between those other two guys. If they're taken at the 11th overall draft pick, their chances aren't that different from somebody who's taken with the fourth overall pick when it comes to historically with quarterbacks. And the great example, one of the great examples in, includes the Minnesota Vikings, where Akili Smith was what, number three overall? Dante Culpepper's number 11. Their, their odds weren't that different. Uh, oh, good question. I forgot to bring this up. Where is Jaden Daniels on the draft board? I apologize for that. I think I skipped right to, I was excited to talk about where uh, JJ McCarthy was. Uh, Jaden Daniels was number eight on the uh, consensus draft board. Of course, this doesn't predict that he'll go number eight. It just means that there are more questions about Jaden Daniels within the draft community than there are about Drake May. That is the best way I could describe what that's telling us is that all the people who watch, there are more questions, more people out there who do the draft who think, you know, I don't know about Jaden Daniels than there are about Drake May where everyone thinks that he is a top tier prospect except for whatever, was it Merrill Hodge? Welcome back to the limelight for that one week, Merrill Hodge. But yeah, like except for Merrill Hodge, Everybody who actually studies the draft thinks that Drake may is top five pick and belongs up there where there's more dissension about Jaden Daniels only by a little still top 10, but by a little. And then there's a lot about uh, JJ McCarthy where there's much less belief that he belongs in the top 10 miles. If we miss on our guy in this draft, do Quasi and Kevin O'Connell keep their jobs to go shopping next off season with massive cap? Well, we're not going to know in a year whether they miss their guy, unless you mean if they miss on any quarterback at all, if they miss on any quarterback at all, and then they don't make the playoffs. Yeah. We could be talking about um, somebody else doing the shopping with all that cap space. That's true because they'll look totally incompetent. If we go through all this, this is why I'm, I'm 98% certain we're talking about a quarterback on draft night because if they did all this talk, the way Kevin O'Connell was talking the other day, you, you would think that the quarterback was in the building that they had. He was talking with such certainty about how you make the guys succeed and everything else and fit that it was like they had already drafted a quarterback. So they'll, they'll draft quarterback. Uh, I don't have any doubts about that. 
but we won't know after one year. I mean, we were just talking about the possibility of that guy not even starting for a year. And in my previous research, I was looking at Geno Smith last year and trying to figure out how long it takes before you really know about a quarterback in the draft. And I thought year three, I mean, look at Justin Fields and the Justin Fields debates that went on even through this year. And I think it wasn't until the end of this season where we were really sure, okay, Justin Fields is not good, but there were times along the way it takes three full seasons in what my research kind of suggested. Of course, there are guys who pop right away and there are guys who are so terrible right away that you're pretty sure. But even look at someone like Jared Goff, miserable in his first year and then gets a lot of help and ends up pretty good. If they brought in Bo Nix and they won five games because he really struggled in his first year, there's no way that they just fired them unless it turns into a total bleep show. But with these guys, it, it doesn't, it won't. We saw last year, they went through a lot of adversity and it did not turn into some sort of total disaster. Um, Habre says if they trade up for Harrison, would anybody be mad? Uh, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to me to get a wide receiver when they already have, when you need someone to throw them the football, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't think that that's on the, uh, that's in the cards. This is a quarterback. They've been planning this to be a quarterback since the moment they got here. I mean, period. The moment they got here, they looked at the timeline and they said, we're drafting a quarterback in either 2023 or 2024. And last year they made phone calls about moving up. They got rejected and this year they're in the driver's seat. So they're going to do it. Uh, let's see, uh, Brent, would you trade this year's first two, uh, two first rounders and a first rounder for 2025 and swap a first rounder in 2026 for a second rounder? If you could get number three, very creative of you, Brent. I like that. Let me think. So you don't have to give away the pick. You just have to swap. Hmm. So you'd be dropping back. Well, by 2026, you're hoping it worked and you're thinking you're dropping back. I mean, if you're thinking that it worked and you're consistently competitive, then you'd only be giving up the 25th pick or something. This is your thought process. And maybe you're getting this, the middle of the second round in a best case scenario. If you're making this trade with new England, I would do that. Yeah, I would do that. I don't want to give up another first because I think that's completely crushing to the franchise's future unless the quarterback is absolutely excellent. But a swap, do not do not dislike that idea. I think that's actually quite clever, Brent. I like that idea. If that's what they do, I'd say, all right, it's pretty wild, but uh, it's, it's certainly all in and maybe a little much for my taste, but that's what it took to get it done. Then that's what it took to get it done. Um, see, I don't look at this. So Drew is saying, look at the dolphins punishment is a, is a case study. Um, you know, yeah, the, I mean, the dolphins and the tampering was crazy. That was, they had already worked out a deal for Brady to have a piece of the team, but then make a comeback something like way over the top. This was not phone calls or texts with assistant coaches. That was very different. Uh, from what happened with the Vikings and Falcons. So I just, I'm having trouble believing that there's going to be some sort of crazy punishment for the Dolphins. Matt B, if they stay put at 11 and draft a quarterback, think they trade down from 23 to pick up some day two draft picks, too much of a gap until the fourth round. Well, that really depends on what everybody else behind them is looking at. If you were in a case where, another team really wanted to trade up with you to take whatever player. Maybe they really love Johnny Newton. Just throw out somebody that could be there. If they really loved him and they were giving you a fairly early second round draft pick, then I, then it's worth it. The way that I've always looked at the draft is I know, and it is true that with every pick you go down, right? If you look at the, your odds of success, it goes down. But just in my brain from covering it, that's probably all of draft history and the entire history of the National Football League. But over the last whatever number of years, I look at it as the very top of the first round has a lot of the superstars. Naturally, the best players in the draft become great. Hot take. 
Then at the back end of the first round, it's a lot of raw players, a lot of this guy's a physical freak, but hasn't put it together yet. And in the second round, it's a little more safer picks that might not have the physical freakish skill or might have some default that somebody doesn't like or what do we call, uh, whatever it is, uh, some demerit against their game that people doesn't like. And so you can often get good draft picks in the early part of the second, but then it usually peters out. It gets to the middle of the second and toward the back of the second into the third, you don't get much. And then after that, it's just total, total crapshoot from there. So I think that if you are moving back to do what you're asking, you can't move back that far. You can't go from 23 to all the way in the back end of the second round. Is it possible to move back into the early part of the second? Cause somebody wants to jump up then yes, they should do that. And they should try to acquire more draft capital. If they've already got their quarterback at number 11, they can do whatever the heck they want. Like that's, that's the goal right there. And I wouldn't care that much about <laughs> almost anything else. Get a defensive player, get a guard. I don't care. Do whatever trade back, whatever you got your quarterback. You're good to go. Uh, let's see. Um, JJ is probably pounding the table for Jaden Daniels. I don't know. I don't know. Um, could be, I mean, the LSU connection really hard to put yourself in Justin Jefferson's shoes. The way that I think of Justin Jefferson is that whoever the quarterback is, he's just, he's going to want the football because he wants to be the reason that they win. And he usually is. So whichever quarterback can get him the ball on time and accurately, he's going to like the most. And then if you can add playmaking, he's going to like it. But if you're Justin Jefferson, your biggest frustration is that you haven't won, right? He's put up all the numbers. He's going to get the contract extension, but your big issue is I have no playoff wins. So whether it's Jaden Daniels or it's Drake may or it's JJ McCarthy, whoever it is, it's get the ball in his direction and win more games. And that's what he was going to make him happy. That was that whole thing out there of, well, is he going to wait and see? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess so. But usually these contracts get signed later in the summer anyway, and he won't know when the guy gets drafted if he's going to be great or not. He's, he's not going to have any idea until he really gets out there on the field with him. So, yeah, I'm sure that he would absolutely want Jaden Daniels because he's such an exciting quarterback and is so good at throwing it down the field. But does that mean if he sees Michael Penix, who just took his team to the national championship, he's going to go, oh, no, no, I quit. I'm playing no more football. See you guys. Uh, e. L. Hassan. It is supply and demand. The Vikings have prepared for this class and the supply is there this time around. That's yep. I agree with that. There is a premium to pay. If we trade up, I'm confident with Quasi's background in analytics that it helps. I, my only concern with Quasi Dafo Mensa and this whole situation is that because he is so analytical and because he does look at the world through this has that value that he might miss the forest through the trees a little, but they've been preparing for this for so long that I don't know that that could be possible. Right. And the person who's going to have the final say, I believe is Kevin O'Connell, not Quasi Adolfo Mensa. It's Quasi Adolfo Mensa's job to make it happen if he can't. But O'Connell is going to put down, here's the guys I'd be comfortable with. Now try to get them for me in order. It's just, would he not go one more, one more draft pick? Because, all right, that's my line in the sand. With everything else, Quasi Adolfo Mensa has drawn the line in the sand and said, I will not pay X number of dollars for Zedaria Smith to come back or for Eric Hendricks or Delvin Cook to come back or for Delvin Tomlinson, even though we knew he was a good player, I'm not paying this number of dollars. That's where I draw the line. That's how he's done his business. And of course, the biggest example is Kirk Cousins. That I'm not going over $40 million. Just for example, with this situation, you can't be that rigid. I think that you have to be willing to put one more chip in or to go one more draft pick to get your guy, because that's just the scenario that you're in. But I think he knows that, right? He, I think sometimes analytics people are painted as, well, they have no common sense or something. There's common sense in this one that Quasi Dafamenta has to understand, right? That the guy can take you to places that um, other teams can't go. 
because you have your guy and anything less, you're not going to succeed anyway, most of the time. So Michael says, uh, I think they should try to make the trade with the Pats for May. And if they can't trade up to four, uh, go for Penix. Yes, Penix, you get who you really want. Yeah, I mean, with Penix and Knicks, we just don't really understand how they feel about those two guys. The consensus draft analysts do not like them as first round draft picks. That doesn't mean the Vikings don't like them as first round draft picks. So your walkaway price, and this is where I'm talking about, could he throw one more chip on the table? Your walkaway price has to deal with how much you like the other guys. And Kwesi said something very similar to that, where the price is the other options that you would walk away from the table. So if the Patriots are saying, look, we're only doing it for what Brent was bringing up earlier, where we're talking about three firsts and a pick swap later on. But Kevin O'Connell says, look, I've got Drake May and Michael Penix only this far away. So why don't we just take Penix instead? And we'll just go from there. Because there's no other way to look at this other than it has to be somewhat of an economics problem because we just don't know based on the guys whether they'll succeed or not. If these were already NFL quarterbacks and they had five years of playing, then you could look at their resumes and go, all right, well, I know exactly how these guys play and I'm willing to pay a little more for the guy who's better. So this would be like Russell Wilson versus Kirk. Clearly the NFL thought nothing of Russell Wilson and a lot of the way that Kirk was playing because they have samples of watching them in actual NFL situations with this, you're talking about, well, maybe Drake may with his skills has a whatever percent chance to be great, but Michael Penix has this percent chance to be at least good. All right, well, we're going to weigh that. Um, so that's kind of how this decision has to go down. I think not Kevin O'Connell says, according to recent history, you win the Super Bowl by either having Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes, or having a quarterback on a rookie contract. That's right. And there's really easy examples to look at in recent history because they've made the Super Bowl <laughs> these last two teams. Now, Stafford is a bit of the exception there, but Stafford also had numerous Hall of Famers on that roster. Aaron Donald, Jalen Ramsey, Vaughn Miller, uh, Andrew Whitworth. I mean, that team was unreal stacked and, you know, kind of got a nice little bounce when they got to face the Bengals and not the, uh, the Kansas city chiefs in the super bowl. Uh, but the last two teams that went to the super bowl had quarterbacks that were making basically no money. And that's a big factor. It really is that they were able to build those great teams around, uh, their, their quarterbacks. And, uh, Mark says we continue to not win super bowls, which we have been doing forever scared of what we've never won. Well, that's what I was talking about with the mentality of Quasi Dafal Mensa, where th this franchise never won. And usually you get one shot at being a GM. I think there are a few GMs who have, you know, popped back into the league. Uh, Tom Telesco got fired and then shows back up with the Raiders. Very strange. Not sure why, since he was not good at his job with the chargers, but usually you get one chance to be a general manager. And I don't think that Quasi Adafo Menso wants to use his one chance at drafting a quarterback and his one chance at general manager to take somebody that he's really not sold on. If it's possible, that's the one thing that gets in a way. If it's possible, because the Patriots might not be open for business. They might not be uh, available for a trade and it might not be possible to truly get your guy. And then you got to believe in the rest of your plan. That would be the, the part that you have to quote settle for is that you didn't tank. You didn't trade away Daniel Hunter. You didn't play, uh, whatever Sean Mannion and lose every game. Instead you won some games and you lost out on your chance to be where the Patriots are. So that's something that you have to deal with. But when it comes down to, if you've got that last you know, that last draft pick to throw in because this is your one shot at this quarterback and your one shot as a GM, then I think you're going to do it because you're aware of, again, the gravity of the situation is we all know that you usually don't get multiple quarterback draft picks. JP, if we end up with anyone, but Bo Nix, we can consider it at least half a win for us specifically if we don't trade up or don't lose that much by trading up. But if we had a shot at May, let's get him 100%. So 
So you're not into the Bo Nix idea. I just, just go back and watch a little Bo Nix. So I just want you to do that because this is what I try to do. I do this throughout draft season. I've done it every year, but I've really done it this year just on a daily basis. So I've been doing a lot of work on this draft guide, purpleinsider.com. Sign up for the newsletter. It's great. I write almost every day. So, uh, I've been doing a lot of work on this, this draft guide where I'm putting together a bunch of stat stuff, background, um, little essays and things like that about the draft. And so I just, in between doing that, when I'm taking a little break, I'll go back and watch a game from any of the quarterbacks, except for Caleb Williams. Cause I don't think there's any chance they do that. So I'm just, I'm just jumping in and going, all right, let me just go back and watch Bo Nix for a game or two. And I watched him back and went, I, I don't get it. I don't, I just don't get why there isn't at least some more appreciation for this quarterback with the way that he operated this offense. It was just fantastic. And it wasn't like he was doing it with knuckleballs. I mean, so I just, if you're really down on one of these particular guys, I guess just, just go back and watch a little bit more because I think you come away with, this is just a very good class. And I don't think I'm taking crazy pills after what Elliot Wolf said and what the Vikings have said. Not Kevin O'Connell. JJ McCarthy is only going to be 22 in 2025 when our Super Bowl window is supposed to open. Can we waste a few years waiting for him to get older? Yeah. Um, that's a hard one because I do wonder about the age factor and how someone like Bo Nix is ready to go right now and ready to get that ball to Justin Jefferson. And so is Michael Penix. Michael Penix, you know, with his health, who knows how long he's going to play if he plays eight years in the league or something or, or less, uh, but they are much more uh, mature prospects by a lot, by three years and more ready to go. I also think that it happens within those first couple years that the guy gets to that place. So if you are 20 years old by 23, you might be a franchise quarterback and, and I, I, I don't know. How old was Josh Allen when they drafted him? Was he maybe 21 or something? And how old was he when he was considered a franchise quarterback? Was he 24? A lot of times it does happen pretty fast and you are asked to be that guy, which McCarthy maturity was not really his issue. I guess you're talking about bringing all the skills together to be a franchise quarterback. I don't know. I mean, it's a fair question of is somebody that young going to be able to handle the whole franchise on their back in a Super Bowl window that's supposed to open up really quickly that you don't have three, four, five years, or at least they don't, you know, we don't think that they do in order to get this thing up to where it's Super Bowl pressure. Um, but you know, I don't know when it comes to, if it was year three, if 2025 they're in the mix and then year three, they've got a real serious chance to win a Super Bowl and he's 23 years old. You're looking at it as the, the window to me is the rookie contract. So how old is he through the rookie contract? 22 to 26 through the rookie contract. That's okay. That's, you know, coming into his prime at that point. If you have one chance at really competing for the Super Bowl in the rookie contract, you've won the draft pick. Can you get that somewhere within JJ McCarthy? Potentially if he's developing along the way. Yeah, I think you can. Uh, E.L. Hassan, do you think that the Vikings have already sent their best offer to the Patriots? Elliot Wolf strategically putting pressure on the Vikings to raise the price. Uh, I don't think that they've sent their best offer to the Patriots. Their best offer will be when Washington picks and takes the guy the Vikings don't want. And then they pick up that phone and say, okay, actually, here's our real offer. What I, I would guess is that there is an offer in place for the Patriots right now. And the Patriots are saying, well, we have no reason to take this right now. Why don't we wait? And when he says open for business, then all right, well, that's maybe, Hey, other teams, if you can top the Vikings offer, we're listening. Uh, but who can top the Vikings offer really only the New York giants, maybe, maybe the New York giants, uh, are the sleeper team of this thing and want to put together that package. And maybe it was a message to the giants. Hey, the Vikings are on the board here with our best offer. Can you top it? Wink, wink. Or it could be, as you said, a message to the Vikings. Why don't you just up that price a little bit? Then we'll consider it. Um, or it could just be 
that NFL people always say, sure. We like all the quarterbacks. Sure. We could trade out. I'll say whatever you want because I'm not telling you the answers. That could also be it. Uh, AJ Brown was the rumor of the day. Drew says, Hmm. So I saw AJ Brown tweet that he was watching the Patriots documentary. So he put Tom Brady in his bio or something. And then everyone thought he was going to the Patriots. Uh, that doesn't really seem like a rumor. That just seems like the internet being really silly at a lot of times. Um, let's see. I mean, you guys are really fascinated by the Falcons thing. We'll just have to see if they do anything about it. Even when we asked Kwesi Adafo Mensa, he was sort of shrugged his shoulders. Like, I don't know. I guess we'll see. It's up to the league. Uh, Sue says, uh, Patriots cannot draft quarterback at three. They're open for business because they want to see if there are any other offers besides the Vikings. That's probably right. Everyone knows it is not a secret at all that the Vikings are trying to trade with the Patriots. So... Yeah, I'm sure that part of this whole conversation is them saying, come on, let's up that offer. Let's make this a little bit better, somebody, and then we'll consider doing it. But we're not going to do it now uh, for what you're offering. And that's that seems reasonable for sort of picking, if we're picking it apart, that seems pretty reasonable. Jeff, if we stick and pick at 11 and 23, it's because it's the plan it could be plan B or C, but it's a plan. I agree with that. Yeah. And everything is a, if we look at it like a road and off ramps. So how about this? When I drive to Green Bay, there are only a handful of places. If you've ever made this trip, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That you would safely get off the highway to go to an Arby's or whatever as you're going through this stretch of insane darkness and scary deer dodging from Minnesota to green Bay to cover those games at Lambeau field, it's always very dicey going through there. And there's only a handful of exits where you can actually get your Arby's. So what you have to decide is which exit you want to take, which one is the most favorable. If you go and you're driving along and your first exit has a really nice Arby's right off of the highway and it's open and you're like, okay, let's get off. That might be trade up to number three with the Patriots. It's the first option. The lights are on. Everybody's good with whatever the price. There's no construction. But if you go and you're driving and you see the Arby's is closed, they're not trading. All right. Now it's on to option B. Uh, but all of it was on the roadmap, right? There isn't, you're not driving in the dark going like, I don't know, do we turn left? That's not what this decision is going to be. It's going to be exit number one is Drake May. Exit number two is stay at 11 and take Bo Nix or maybe JJ McCarthy. That's my hot take is that they'll pick McCarthy at 11. That That's how it's going to be done. And all of those roadmaps are being finalized, I think now over these last couple of days and they'll go into next week with their complete map, choose your own adventure. If this happens, or in this case, it's other teams choose your adventure for you, which is the, maybe the hard part about this. Really the only super hard part about it for them is that other teams are choosing your adventure for you, as opposed to you getting to be able to say which you want, but that's the draft that's sports. Uh, Jimbo, two scenarios to discuss. First is a three team trade with the Cardinals and Patriots cards, get 11, uh, 23 and the Vikings, 20, uh, 25 first Vikings get three. The Patriots get the fourth overall pick and then 2025 third and fourth to move down for McCarthy. So that was complicated Jimbo, but what you're saying is a three team trade that would involve if I'm following the Cardinals ending up with 11 and 23, the Patriots moving back to four and the Vikings getting three. I could see it. I could see multiple movements. I could see them dropping back the Patriots dropping back to number 11 and then moving back up to number six or something. If they're not going to, if the giants are not going to make that pick, I just think with Arizona, they should just pick Marvin Harrison Jr., right? He's the number one player on the consensus board. 
He's talked about as one of the best receiver prospects to ever come out. He's just take him. It's the Chargers who could get an offensive lineman later. It's the Giants. It's the Titans. All these teams should really want to move back to get offensive linemen. Not a twerk says uh, what happens to Jaron Hall practice squad. Probably QB three. Uh, Jaron Hall, if he has an NFL career, it'll be a huge win for him. If he stays in the NFL, uh, that's what happened last year against the Packers was a guy who was way in over his head and Kevin O'Connell tried to be positive about that. But I think we all knew that look, he was just weighing over his head in the NFL. He's going to spend an entire year trying to prove that that's not the case. But I think from a physical perspective, he's just not good enough to play in the NFL. Doesn't have the arm, doesn't have the speed, doesn't have, he's okay at all these things, maybe to get drafted, but it's just not going to be a thing. So it was fine. I wasn't a huge fan of the pick to begin with, and it would have been nice if he had worked out because then you have your backup quarterback, but there's no ceiling on a player who's 25 years old, undersized, without a big arm, and doesn't have a difference-making athleticism as he found out in Atlanta. So if he's your backup, then okay. But I, like number three, maybe a backup over a couple of years. It just, that's a pick that just didn't work out. Uh, Aubrey says, uh, how are the Vikings going to Vikings this draft? <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, I don't know because they've drafted quarterbacks in the past. Some of them have worked, some of them not. They haven't drafted a ton. They don't have a huge history. The, the, the most Vikings thing that could happen would be they draft a guy and he tears everything in his knee in the first week of mini camp or something, but sorry, I'll knock on wood on that one. That, that would be the most Vikings thing. And then Sam Darnold takes him to the NFC championship. There you go. That's the most Vikings thing is that they trade everything for Drake may and Sam Darnold takes them to the NFC championship. <laughs> that would be it. All right. A couple more here. You guys have been awesome as always. Uh, E.L. Hassett says Vikings are going to have a bunch of third round picks. Uh, that is what they should use to sweeten the deal. Yeah. Yeah. That if they throw in another third round pick, I don't care. That's fine. If they need to do that, it's really about adding another first rounder to where you end up with three years of firsts going to new England to get your guy versus just taking another good prospect. Chris, is it such a bad thing if they decide to draft Terry and Arnold and chop Robinson or Newton build a bully defense and stick with Darnold. Yes, that is a bad thing. Yep. That is a, that's a terrible thing. Sam Darnold has as many interceptions as touchdowns in his career. There's no turnaround that you can find outside of maybe Vinny Testaverde ever for somebody starting their career this bad and then actually becoming a potential Super Bowl quarterback. No, not into that. Not into that. Nope. I agree that they need these defensive players for sure, but you need to have really, really, really good quarterback play. If you're making the Super Bowl. there's lots of good defenses in the world over the years. And a couple of them have reached the Super Bowl ever. So yeah, I mean, w- would it be better to your point to split the difference, which would be all right, 11 and 23 defensive player, shut down corner, defensive tackle and quarterback. Yes. But no, Sam Darnold is not an option here. In fact, you wouldn't even know he exists when we do the press conferences with Kevin O'Connell. You wouldn't even, he does, his name doesn't even come up. So yeah, no, it's, you can't, you can't have him be an option. I, I, yes, I understand all of the, I'm not down on Sam Darnold, by the way. I'm only at a, like, look, this is not the guy. This is not the guy. It's like Aaron uh, or um, Sam Darnold is at best a serviceable quarterback to continue you on a competitive rebuild. If you need him to play the whole season because your quarterback isn't ready, then you can and you can compete for a playoff spot, maybe. But you're talking about in the best case Sam Darnold scenario, he gives you what Gardner Minshew gave the you know Colts last year. That's what you're kind of looking for. And yeah, you know, they bring up Baker Mayfield. It's actually quite telling where, who was this the other day? One of the Vikings players brought up Baker Mayfield as an example of, Hey, you know, Sam Darnold bounced around, but he could be like Baker Mayfield. 
Baker Mayfield went nine and eight last year. Is that what we're looking for here? I mean, he went, he's this ma great magical story of someone who uh, revived their career and got his team into the playoffs and won a playoff game against a totally broken Philadelphia Eagles team. Baker Mayfield went nine and eight. I mean, that's not what you're going for. And that's like, that's a best case situation. I don't think so. So, you know, I just, I, I don't look at that as any sort of option for them. They're drafting a quarterback. It's just who they're going to draft is really the question. And that I do not know. Still, we're all the way this deep into this process. And I still don't know who the Vikings are going to draft or if they're going to trade the house or what is going to happen. Uh, let's see. Uh, Drew says most Pats fans want Drake and for him to sit for a year, but there are some crazies out there. Well, and if we're still adding up all the scenarios, the most likely still is that they are going to stay there and pick at number three and the Patriots are going to take their quarterback. The, I guess the one question is, would it be, you know, Drake may, or would it be the guy who reminds them of Tom Brady and uh, JJ McCarthy? How, how real is this McCarthy hype is what we are going to find out for, from a national perspective, not just us, that has to be number one on everybody's list of most interesting thing, right? For this draft, is this McCarthy thing real or not? Uh, El Hassan, uh, do you know what our offer was last year to get Anthony Richardson? That should give you an idea of what they were willing to pay. I do not, uh, know what their offer was. I know that it was reported shortly after the draft by Ben Gessling of the star tribune that they had put together something significant to try to move up. And then later that came up, um, from somebody else and it sort of made the rounds because aggregators, I guess, rule the universe. But um, I, I think that Quasi Adolfo Mensa, a lot of stuff gets out there of, well, the Vikings had this conversation or this, whatever. It sounds to me from the way he talked the other day is that he's on the phone a lot and he's asking questions a lot and having ideas a lot. Hey, what would it take for us to move up to number four was probably the question for Anthony Richardson, or maybe it was Stroud, or maybe it was Bryce Young. There were all you know, somebody that they would want to build around and sit behind Kirk for a year. Although Richardson made the most sense there. So I'm guessing that it was likely three firsts. I mean, three firsts was the bar that was set by Trey Lance for that trade for the 49ers. So if you're going to do something similar, that's what you have to do. They were trying to go, this is different though. So it won't really tell us because a, there's more quarterbacks and they were trying to go from 23 to the top five. That doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, that would have taken insane, insane capital to move up uh, to do that. Just a Super Bowl Vike. Get it if you can. If you can't, it's not worth it. I assume you mean uh, the pick from the Patriots. Get Penix or Knicks at 11 or 23. With this roster, with Penix or Knicks, you'll get your picks worth uh, with this roster being the way um, it's built. Yeah. I, that's what I think where a lot of you are um, really locking into this is the, this is my favorite thing. And if they don't do this, then I'll be disappointed. But when you watch these quarterbacks, you could, I think very easily envision them having success with the team that the Vikings have. The one argument that I think may win that debate by a, a hair is all right. Well, look at the quarterbacks in the division. How are you going to beat them? Well, all right. I mean, that's what makes it a little bit harder. Do you need someone who's really special to beat them? But then again, Brock Purdy and Jalen Hurts were in the Super Bowls the last two years. Neither one of them, when they came out in the draft, were thought of as being special. That's another part of it as well, that sometimes we get this idea about guys and what turns out to be the best thing is how they fit with the actual team. That was the case that was being made by Kevin O'Connell the other night. So anyway, um, <laughs> uh, we've gotten to the point so far after nine o'clock that you're on crack has entered the uh, conversation, the discussion, not directed at, at me, I don't think, but um, that's probably where it's time to, to pop out 
um, for the evening. So, uh, you know, uh, here's a, a point from huge boy. Good to see you says, uh, why do we never talk about having an elite head coach or general manager? If our current head coach and GM aren't elite, we should dump them. And Kyle Shanahan and Howie Roseman built contenders despite not having an elite quarterback. Well, they got elite quarterback play. So there is a difference there, right? It, just not having this. Well, this is kind of the point about Bo Nix or Penix or whatever is Jalen Hurts and Brock Purdy play to MVP levels to be able to get them to the Super Bowl. So just because you don't think they're elite and maybe they won't be elite for 10 years doesn't mean they weren't elite in that year. So you have to find a way to get great, great quarterback play, which does tie into the coach and the general manager. It is a good point. So with both Kevin O'Connell and Kwesi Adafo Mensa, I have been in the camp that we just don't really know yet on whether it's going to work out with either one of them. I like a lot of the things that both of them have done. So it matters a lot that the NFL Players Association survey, the players are giving Kevin O'Connell an A plus, that matters. That Kirk Cousins had a relationship that he did, that matters. There are downsides to O'Connell. I'm not sure he manages the game the best because he is so in that play caller's mindset. I uh, think he gets cute sometimes a little bit. Don't think he understands the run game very well. Maybe Aaron Jones can help him uh, with that this year. There are deficiencies, but this is going to be his third year as a head coach. So maybe we'll see some of those get sharpened up, but there's going to be strengths and weaknesses of every coach. Um, Andy Reed runs trick plays on every third down and short. So I don't know. So Andy Reed for a long time, couldn't manage a clock until he had Mahomes, And then suddenly he was better at it. So I don't know. Uh, but would I call O'Connell an elite coach? No, he's going to have to prove that. And for uh, the way that the Philadelphia Eagles and 49ers rosters have been built, nothing short of genius. I mean, the way that they put together the playmakers, the trades that they made, I was very down on the Christian McCaffrey trade. Totally wrong. Great trade. I mean, he stayed healthy, which is a big deal, but that was a great trade for them. Uh, picking a random quarterback at the end of the seventh round is a great idea too. Kind of got lucky there, but they've built total total, complete, great rosters. Their use of assets that they have has been tremendous. And the coaching uh, for Kyle Shanahan is as good as it gets in the NFL. So that's who you're competing with. That's a good point. We're going to find out. We don't know right now. And we've got to give it a little more time before we know. But I think the signs are good. The signs point to if you hit the right quarterback, could you win with this head coach and GM? I think the answer is yes. And more than anything, they followed exactly the plan that they laid out and they executed it. That's the most important thing for me, believing that they're competent is that they did that. Plans don't always work, but are you competent or are you just haphazard? They've seemed both of them competent to better. So anyway, well, great stuff, guys. Great stuff. Super fun. Uh, I'm just going to ask if you're hanging around and you enjoyed this that uh, go over to purpleinsider.com. You can scroll down. There's a bunch of articles there. You click on any one of them. You can sign up for the newsletter, can sign up for free, uh, can sign up uh, on the contributing side as well to unlock all the content there, but you'll get articles very regularly too if you're on the free side or like half of the mailbag or something, however it works out. So uh, that's a great way if you want to support the channel, but also on Monday, drop in the big draft guide where it's got all sorts of essays, columns, information, whatever. So go over there, purpleinsider.com. Check that out. And look, if you're joining for the first time, you're enjoying it, welcome. Thank you. And draft night, half hour before the draft, we're going to start right here. We're going to go through the first round, breaking down everything that the Vikings do. So um, <laughs> yeah, the, the super chat idea. So the super chat idea comes up all the time. I, I would love more if you go sign up for the newsletter. If you want to contribute, that's the best way to do it over there rather than making people pay to ask questions. I don't like to do that. So thanks everybody. Uh, really, really appreciate your time. So if you, but if you want to contribute, that's the way to do it. Sign up for the newsletter. You'll get my articles every day and uh, we'll have, you know, hopefully you'll enjoy it. So thanks again, everybody. We'll probably do another one of these, at least another one of these conversations before the draft night and then live coverage draft night 
all sorts of guests, trying my hardest to book a very, very special guest. So we'll see, trying to work that out for next week. Anyway, thanks everybody. And we'll catch you next time. Football.